Thank you so much, Professor Zhang, uh, for introducing me. And uh, it's my honor to actually speak uh, in front of you um, as a new undergraduates and graduates, as well as, um, um, although not many, I can see from the list, um, NUS um, graduates um, and undergraduates. <clears throat> I actually have uh, um, many friends uh, at NUS uh, who are working as um, uh, faculty members there. So uh, it's also my pleasure to give this um, talk uh, in front of uh, um, many NUS affiliated um, academics. So today I'm going to um, talk about uh, organic electronics, um, more specifically on um, charge transport and the um, field effect transistors made of organic semiconducting materials and how I totally um, at the very end, um, I know uh, this is meant to be introductory, um, but if I could show you briefly um, what my research and my research contributions have been um, towards um, doping um, perspectives of organic electronics. Um, but I, I'll make sure uh, I finish in time uh, so that this doesn't um, drag on forever. Okay, uh, so let's start. So although uh, Professor Jan uh, introduced me uh, kindly, I just wanted to briefly introduce myself. So I actually... Um, I uh, lived in UK for quite long, uh, so um, I started my undergraduate from 2008 uh, in the University of Cambridge, uh, where I did my undergraduate, um, master's, as well as the um, PhD. And then uh, it was a, a big decision for me to come back uh, to Korea uh, and um, work as a postdoc at Seoul National University, and that was at uh, the Department of Physics uh, at the lab of Professor Taki Lee. Um, and then um, I, I joined Yonsei University as an assistant professor, um, and after a brief uh, time there, I uh, came back to SNU um, with pleasure um, to start uh, uh, my job as an assistant professor. And as Professor Zhang mentioned, I'm leading uh, currently one lab. Um, so uh, my overall research actually um, focuses on, on organic materials um, and organic and organic hybrid materials, uh, especially their transport and doping um, uh, mechanisms. And I'm, I've recently been inter interested in uh, how I could actually uh, make use of these concepts uh, into more functional organic devices form um, so that um, we could get the device applications out um, of the concepts. And if I just briefly mention uh, my um my um research types um so if i could may um, suggest uh, that my research uh, has been um, some fundamental um, research on doping and transport mechanisms and there's been some pioneering pioneering uh, research concepts um including the spin transport in organics and how i've been able to make use of these concepts into more innovative forms and devices um i'm continuously doing so so the outline of uh, this lecture with the following. Uh, so the first two um, parts of my lecture will be very introductory. Um, so um, bear with me, if um, please bear with me, even if uh, it is uh, much familiar to you. Um, so I'm going to introduce you uh, the uh, concept of organic semiconductors, and then move on to uh, the um, the history and the development of organic FETs. And lastly, on um, to more related to my research topics on to doping. Okay, so let's start. Um, right, story of glowing gherkin and display panel. Um, okay, they might sound very, very, very strangely uh, unrelated, but um, maybe after watching this um, video clip um, by um, Professor Vladimir uh, Bilovich um, from MIT, uh, AECS, uh, could um, get you some idea. So let me just briefly switch my slide uh, to this YouTube clip, uh, which demonstrates this uh, concept. Just a second. What we just observed was the electron injection into an organic matter. Now, that's a fancy way for simply saying, if I go ahead and inject some charge on one end and some opposite charge on the other end, they can meet in the middle and excite a molecule. That molecule will glow. 
especially if it has a lot of sodium, like you're seeing right here. So the consequence is that given any material, I can electrically excite it. Often things are not very, very efficient in the way they glow, and hence we don't necessarily observe it. Here, we're passing a lot of current through a very small amount of material. Even if it's not very efficient in glowing, it's going to still be observed because we're just doing it so repeatedly over and over and over and over again. So by no means is this a very efficient LED that you observe, but the essence of it is very similar to what happens in these very slick looking displays. This is an organic light emitting display. It uses organic light emitting devices, which essentially are thin layers of molecules. And you're looking at a series of them, the ones that emit red, green, and blue side by side to generate these full color images you're observing here. But what you're really looking at is uh, thin films, 100 molecules thick, that have two electrodes, one on top, one on the bottom. You apply about five volts between the top and the bottom, and current will flow through those molecules. As OK, I think that um, probably uh, is enough uh, for demonstrating my purpose. Uh, so let me switch back to my slide. OK, so you might, might have got the idea. I don't know if anyone uh, in the, uh, out of the participants um, would be able to tell me what the relationship between them is, uh, common thing between them. Yes, I expected this um, silence, uh, so I'm going to give you the answer uh, myself. So um, the common thing between them is that um, basically you are seeing emission from organic materials. And this process of having uh, light emission from electricity is called electroluminescence. So uh, there's this uh, answer in here uh, shown as an example where um, you're injecting electron and injecting hole from the other side, and they form an exciton in the middle that they can um, re recombine to produce a photon. So this process is common in the glowing gherkin and also what's happening in the OLED display. So you might be wondering what these materials are made of or what they are. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what organic semiconductor is. Basically, they are organic materials, um, but they are behaving as semiconductors. So what gives rise uh, the semiconducting properties of them? Right, so um, there are these um, examples of the organic semiconductors where um, all of them are basically pi conjugated system. So uh, you're seeing this um, prototype uh, organic semiconductor here called polyacetylene, where you have this um, double bond and single carbon bond um, alternating in between, such that you're forming this pi conjugated system along the chain. And what's happening is, if you remember uh, the basic chemistry course, uh, in carbon has four uh, valence electrons. So what that means is that it's able to form um, four uh, or, uh, or share four electrons uh, from each atom. And as you can see here, if there was no double bond, there's going to be, uh, there, there's going to be three number of bonds um, uh, out of this carbon atom. But having, by having this double bond and that double bond, what that reflects is that there's this PZ orbital, which is sticking out um, of the plane. That sticks out of the plane. Um, that um, is um, available for each carbon atom in the chain that can form pi bonds. And this is basically uh, why you're, um, you're, you're doing exactly the linear combination of atomic orbitals that you learned from basic chemistry course. So if they, um, if they form bonding orbital and the pi bonding orbital happens to be delocalized over the entire chain, then it allows a channel for electrons or holes to flow. So this is the mechanism for charge transport in intra-chain uh, charge transport in the organic semiconductor. And when we use more sophisticated language, uh, such as uh, the electronic structure, why we call uh, organic semiconductors, although they are called wide gap uh, uh, semiconductors, uh, it is uh, related to how large this HOMO to LUMO gap is. So HOMO, to remind you, is the highest occupied molecular orbital that access valence band maximum, almost similar. And LUMO is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, um, which is um, analogous to conduction band minimum. Basically, uh, if this energy scale is um, um, reasonably, um, reasonably um, within uh, what we can interact with, such as photons and the visible light, so that'll be between um, three electron volt uh, to one electron volt, 
um, then uh, you call them semiconductor because um, we get properties out uh, that we can make use um, of them uh, in the display or solar cells, for example. So um, now if you imagine um, this um, chain elongates and also um, forms an infinitely large chain, then this would actually become the um, conduction band and the variance band, uh, such as what you know from semiconductors. So uh, since I've given you a brief introduction on to organic semiconductors, I'm going to switch back uh, to OLED uh, to give you the motivation of my talk. So um, here is the slide um, which um, with low resolution, and trust me, uh, it's not uh, my fault. Um, this low resolution uh, was um, at the time a high, highest resolution uh, of the clips um, available. So um, foldable and rollable displays, uh, you might have seen them um, a lot nowadays, but how these concepts or when these concepts were demonstrated were uh, since CES 2013. That was about nine years ago. So um, at the time, uh, since uh, I was uh, the second year PhD student, I was thinking, yeah, okay, you can come up with all the dreams you want. But um, nowadays, um, what you're seeing is um, after six years, uh, we are getting uh, Galaxy X Fold, um, and there's also Z Flip, um, which um, folds uh, in, the, uh, in the vertical direction. And there's a rollable TV that's devised by LG Display. Um, so all these technological advances, um, they were predicted or, um, uh, or which might have seemed futuristic uh, in the past, uh, have now become realized uh, into more available practical um, uh, gadget forms now. So that was very surprising uh, to share. And uh, all these displays are made of these um, AMOLED. Uh, so I know this is a very cheesy, cliche slide um, that uh, people use for AMOLED displays. But um, I think sometimes it's good to actually um, give you slides that you know already uh, to get you into the um, zone. Um, so uh, this was, I think, um, back in 2013, uh, 12, uh, where uh, AMOLED display um, was on Adwit uh, on this um, popular uh, K-Pop girl group um, at the time. Uh, I don't think anymore. Um, so AMOLED basically it stands for OLED. Um, so Active Matrix Organic Light Emitting Diode. And I'm going to um, tell you more about what this means in details. Um, but uh, first of all, how AMOLED displays have developed now. So they are taking a large proportion of what we are, uh, what we are seeing from the um, computer or the tablet or the mobile displays at the moment. <clears throat> So it's um, actually uh, has a high proportion in the market shares uh, in terms of um, dollar billions. We are plotting uh, from 2012, how much uh, of the market share as mobile and tablet PC and TV displays have taken use of AMOLED displays. And <clears throat> you can actually um, see a lot of them now. I mean, if you have iPhones or Samsung um, mobile phones nowadays, and they're basically uh, made of um, AMOLED displays. So, <clears throat> what is OLED and then and what is um active matrix uh, the concept? So being active matrix, uh, it means that um each pixel uh, which forms displays. So as you know, to get um a um, full spectrum of the color, you need red, green, and blue pixels. And this red, green, and blue pixels, um, which are made of, for example, either LCD or um, LEDs, they need to switch. So um, there's a way of passive matrix where uh, not each individual um, um, pixel has a switch, but it kind of has like a crossbar cross array form where you put a voltage in between one line and the second line and the inter intersecting points actually um, switch on. Um, although, um, uh, and, and in contrast, um, what happens in active matrix display is for each pixel, you actually have these switches. And also um, at the same time, you have this um, so switches are um, used um, as TFTs, which are uh, which stand for thin film transistors. Um, of an example shown here, and there's actually, there are actually two transistors that are needed. One is a switching transistor for actually switching on off uh, the pixels, and there's also a driving transistor which um, actually um, provides enough um, electrical power into each pixel so that you provide enough electricity to uh, emit um, a certain wavelength of light. And how is it actually advantageous uh, over LCD? Um, so the quantitatively, I'm going to um, tell you in the next slide, but um, there's this um, big factor that we don't actually need the backlight uh, for AMOLED displays, uh, unlike an LCD. Basically, um, LCDs, uh, they stand for liquid crystalline display, 
where uh, liquid crystals um, by um, upon um, electrical input, they can align to a certain extent or, or misalign. And um, from that, what you can do is you can play with the polarization of the light and therefore it can act as a color filter. So by structurally rearranging liquid crystals by uh, electricity, what you can do is allow some certain um, parts of light or certain parts of pixels and, and disallow uh, some of the pixels, which means turning on and off uh, the pixels. And therefore, since you need backlight on as always, because what's blocking the light is not turning off the light, but it's actually um, uh, turning off uh, the light by uh, filtering, you always need the backlight on, therefore the power consumption um, becomes much larger than the AMOLED uh, display, for example. And the contrast is much better. Um, and uh, so um, this uh, is the slide that shows you uh, that um, OLED could actually potentially be also useful for these um, augmented reality or virtual reality applications um, because, um, because of um, these different working principles and the device principles, we actually have a much larger viewing angle um, for OLED. And also the response speed is much faster for OLED because you're actually using a switch, electrical switch, to switch on and off each pixel. So for example, if you want to play um, with augmented, augmented reality or VR, these um, computer games, for example, you don't want your, um, um, you don't, you don't want your um, uh, screen uh, to be lagging, but you want it to be changing as fast as possible. And that's also related to the uh, speed and the response speed of how fast each pixel can turn on or turn off. So um, all these requirements of being fast and being bright and ultra high resolution, which is uh, actually the hardest to meet at the moment for OLED devices, um, OLED actually has a very big future uh, in terms of um, extending onto uh, the future display applications as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me go back and um, talk more about these transistors. So in the end, um, OLEDs, um, um, because organic materials are mechanically flexible, um, these can be used in terms of uh, new form factor devices, such as um, bendable displays and flexible displays. And that is why we also like to, in the future, replace these currently rigid uh, transistors to organic uh, transistors as well. Although uh, it seems very hard at the moment uh, due to the challenges that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this um, TFT, um, so um, as with the um, current and voltage characteristics, which are shown here as an uh, example, um, need to be developed further uh, in order to completely um, replace um, these um, current um, rigid uh, transistors uh, for new form factor displays. And also it's, um, it's also uh, imperative to actually understand where uh, the transport properties come from in these um, organic TFTs and also how they can be improved. So that's going to be the uh, focus of my next topic. So next on to the charge transport and organic FETs. So first briefly by um, contrast and uh, the differences um, between uh, the um, charge transport property uh, of organics and inorganics, um, you first need to uh, look at the bonding characteristics. So, uh, so organic materials, and um, they are actually um, formed by van der Waals bonding, whereas inorganic materials, and um, they are um, uh, sustained by covalent ionic, ionic bonding. So in terms of the strength of bonding, of course, uh, it's covalent ionic bonding is going to be much stronger than van der Waals bonding. And that gives, you, uh, gives rise to this mechanical flexibility in the organic materials, um, unlike in inorganics. And the charge transport, and uh, since and also related to this van der Waals bonding, uh, the, it's, um, it's um, mainly a um, popping process, um, unlike in inorganics, where it tends to be a um, band transport. Uh, so meaning uh, there's an extended uh, band within the system that electrons can just um, move within, whereas popping uh, is more discontinuous, and therefore these energy levels are not uh, matching aligned uh, with each other. Therefore, you need uh, sometimes thermal energy uh, to hop in between. And that actually is the result of why the mobility in organics is very low uh, compared to inorganics. So in organics, uh, the mobility, um, it, although it's improved much, now, uh, um, much further, um, typical mobility that you observe in organics is around one centimeter squared per volt seconds. Whereas in inorganics, um, with um, uh, new semiconductors, as well as um, the poly, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the polyprecine silicon and uh, and single person silicon, and they can be up to thousand centimeters squared of all second. 
why we need, want to use um, organic uh, materials for um, solar cells um, or also um, LEDs is uh, also uh, coming from the optical properties. So first uh, on to why we want to use it as solar cells, possible solar cell material, is that because organic materials has a, has a um, larger um, absorption coefficient compared to inorganics. And this is actually related to the electronic structure. Um, with, uh, if, if time allows, I'll actually go into more details, but uh, due to the density of states uh, being much um, more um, uh, narrow uh, in, the, uh, in the energy, uh, absorption coefficient tends to be bigger in organic materials. And um, excitons, uh, Frankel excitons, uh, basically means that the binding energy uh, of these excitons. So exciton basically means it's an electron hole pair. An electron hole pair in organics is much larger, uh, much stronger, bi uh, stronger binded, and then in the inorganics, um, where uh, the uh, the energy scale uh, can be actually uh, more than um, five times or even an order of magnitude um, uh, different between the organics and inorganics in terms of the binding energy. And that also is related uh, to how large these excitons are. So basically, small excitons, uh, you call them Frankel, and larger excitons, you call them Vanier mott. And all of these, um, and in fundamentally, they're related to the dielectric constant, where uh, the dielectric constant in organics, it tends to be, so polarizability uh, tends to be much stronger in organics uh, than in organics. Right, uh, enough of details. Um, so let's uh, move on to more the uh, transport. So um, in order to uh, look at the transport, I thought it would be uh, wise uh, to just give you a brief introduction to perhaps the Drude model and the um, Ohm's law um, before actually going into details. So um, crystal morphologies um, of organic solids. So we're actually um, going to cover not in much details um, because of the time, but um, the three different types of organic materials. First one is the audit uh, crystalline, um, so very crystalline system. So they're called molecular single crystals. Um, um, and they are mainly made of small molecules. So small molecules, single crystals. And polycrystalline film, um, so polycrystalline system uh, with certain grain boundaries uh, that you've learned in material science courses. Um, so these um, polycrystalline uh, systems also are made of small molecules, but in between uh, there are polymeric uh, semiconductors which show um, a semi-crystalline uh, morphology or amorphous uh, morphology uh, to actually make uh, the charge transport processes much more complex. So these three systems are the main representatives um, of what uh, constitutes organic semiconductors in terms of um, electronic active materials. So if you just compare again uh, the details uh, of the bonding, so um, this case, uh, it represents the case of pentacin. Uh, pentacin basically is a polyacin that's made of five-membered um, um, aromatic rings uh, fused together. As you can see here, um, when these um, pentacin molecules pack uh, in a the system, they uh, form a certain lattice. But um, how are they maintaining uh, such a um, crystalline structure is via weak van der Waals interaction. So this, um, as you can see, if you imagine that you look, look at it from the side, then you know this is like a herringbone uh, um, structure uh, where um, you, um, you've seen a lot um, in the um, tiles or in the um, clothes um, fashion, uh, herringbone fashion. And um, this pi pi overlap um, between the pentacin molecules uh, gives you actually a very small bandwidth. So bandwidth is related to what energy window you can use for transport processes. And in organics, it looks as if the bandwidth is um, much smaller than that of inorganics. And that is also related to why the transport process is much more hindered in organics than in inorganics. So um, this almost retains single molecular properties because um, having bandwidth so small also um, is due to the fact that the um, bonding uh, or the interaction between the molecules is not so strong. And therefore, single molecular properties are reasonably retained. And uh, as I mentioned, um, hopping transport um, is uh, mainly dominant. Um, and um, this um, actually results in low charge carry mobility, uh, meaning short mean free path. And we need to actually discuss um, mean free path uh, in the Druid model, uh, the next slide. But if we just can compare relatively um, in inorganic crystals, um, as I mentioned, uh, everything's different. So instead of pi pi overlap, you have these um, sigma bonds. Uh, so um, if you look at the case of silicon, for example, um, 
you have uh, this sigma bond covalent bonding and that uh, holds the lattice very strong um, and from that uh, the um, the orbital overlap is much stronger and therefore the bandwidth uh, that you get in the system uh, is over a larger extent and also in terms of energy scale uh, you have much larger bandwidth so uh, the band uh, space is much bigger in energy so uh, this completely loses the single molecular properties or single atomic properties um, of um, silicon and because what you're seeing uh, in the electronic processes is actually from the interaction between these um, silicon orbitals rather than the single molecular or single atomic properties and this tends to result in band transport which represents um, delocalized carriers and uh, also results in high carrier mobility with a long mean free path so uh, the concept of mean free path, uh, and, and if I remember uh, correctly, uh, I remember uh, attending uh, Professor Zhang's lecture uh, earlier on in uh, early August, um, where she um, briefly introduced us uh, onto the transport models, and mine will be very uh, much simpler, um, but um, hopefully this will be a reminder of um, uh, all the details that we learned from Professor Zhang's lecture. So uh, the van transport model, uh, that actually describes transport in uh, crystalline, crystalline inorganic structures uh, is a drilled model. Uh, so you actually assume that uh, the carriers are all delocalized. And um, this um, carrier transport is hindered um, by scattering uh, of phonons or ionized impurities. So um, they don't travel in a straight line, for example, but due to these um, scatterings, uh, you can actually scatter off uh, these impurities uh, like, uh, sorry, uh, seen here. So um, these carriers, although um, they are scat they're scattering, statistically, uh, we can um, use this concept of collective motion uh, of the carriers undergoing a drift uh, under an applied electric field with a drift, a particular drift velocity, Vd. So it doesn't mean an individual um, motion of electrons uh, or charges, but uh, how they in overall um, carry charges uh, within the system. So uh, I think it was um, quite fun to play around with um, how this um, drift um, um, motion looks like. Um, so we understand things microscopically, but when it becomes more than two and three, you know, it is very hard to imagine uh, things. But uh, if you go into this website, it seems like a nice way of um, uh, visualizing uh, this drift uh, process. So there comes the concept of mobility. Uh, so it's an intrinsic property of materials that measures how fast uh, the charge carriers can move. So um, VD and the drift velocity uh, is actually defined by the mobility times the electric field. And um, mobility uh, basically, um, since it's an intrinsic property of materials, it's also related to other intrinsic properties, such as um, the scattering time, scattering time, um, um, of which the inverse and the reciprocal is a scattering rate. So how fast uh, the uh, scattering occurs. And also there's this concept of effective mass. So, um, Everything, um, if you, um, every um, velocity or motion uh, uh, is related to inertia. And mass, um, being more massive, um, as you all know, uh, trivially, uh, means that it has a bigger inertia and therefore is harder to drop, travel. And if your effective mass of carriers is larger, of course, and then electrons become heavier, meaning uh, the drift velocity will be smaller. So um, from these um, parameters, we can actually define the mean free path where uh, the mean distance um, between two scattering events uh, being the mean free path is given by L equals V thermal times uh, the tau scattering. Where V thermal is different to the drift velocity and uh, being the thermal velocity of charge carriers uh, with uh, this um, ensemble of systems at a particular temperature T. So and uh, now uh, there is a definition of band transport um, and also um, also um, some other transport where band transport is actually defined as where the mean free path, i.e. the mean distance between two scattering events is much larger than uh, the um, mean distance between the scattering centers or the characteristic uh, lattice parameters of the system. So this actually represents van transport, but as I mentioned, the hopping transport uh, on the other hand, or localized transport will be the case exactly the opposite. So L being uh, much smaller uh, than A. So uh, hopefully I've given you a brief uh, introduction of what Druid model is. And also, um, to be honest, I don't think uh, uh, you need uh, this kind of introduction um, since uh, you are all diligent um, material uh, science students or engineering students. Um, so. Um, Yes, um, mobility is an int intrinsic property, but um, when we actually measure um, experimentally uh, um, uh, how good a conductor a material is, we actually need to send in um, uh, 
current um, by applying voltage. So in terms of um, extensive uh, quantities, uh, not the intrinsic um, quantities, we actually need to measure current and the voltage and the resistance uh, from that. So um, then resistance, as you know, uh, can be scaled uh, to intrinsic parameters such as resistivity and also the conductivity. Um, so um, this basically is also um, how um, <clears throat> and the input voltage uh, uh, is proportional to the output current. And also uh, from these, uh, what we can extract is uh, this mobility uh, from experiments and also um, the conductivity uh, of a material, um, which is an important concept uh, during this course. So um, this uh, actually represents uh, the uh, main differences um, between the electronic structure um, of the organic semiconductors uh, to inorganic semiconductors. Um, basically, um, so if you have um, a single molecule, uh, you've all learned um, in the basic chemistry course that you actually form these molecular orbitals and you label them according to how many up to, um, up to what levels uh, the electrons are actually filled. So HOMO represents highest occupied molecular orbital to remind you, meaning that um, this um, has the electrons filled up to this level, whereas LUMO is the next level uh, where the, uh, the energy level starts to have um, unoccupied um, states um, of electrons. So this is completely unoccupied. So lowest unoccupied molecular orbital um, being uh, the next level. And there, there exists a gap in between, um, which actually is controlled, uh, also tuned by the uh, strength um, of the molecular uh, bonding. So this gap, um, to remind you, uh, is very similar uh, to uh, the um, band gap that we have in the conduction band and valence band because they come from the same origin. Uh, so as I mentioned, you need uh, the um, orbital um, overlap uh, with each other. And, and, and that actually, in, when you uh, treat it extens in, extensively in the solid, becomes a band structure. Organic semiconductor is kind of in between, uh, where uh, the bandwidth, uh, there is a finite bandwidth, so it's actually represented by this um, blurry line for each state, but this bandwidth becoming much um, smaller. So if we just compare the bandwidth um, of BW, what's represented as BW here, a uh, large bandwidth of the inorganic material uh, to a small uh, bandwidth of organic material, and that comes from the um, smaller, um, smaller um, orbital um, interaction uh, with each other. So if I um, skip and then uh, come back to you on the, um, just a second. So um, the Van der Waals bonding. Uh, so uh, the um, Van der Waals bonding you've ever learned um, in um, undergraduate courses uh, uh, with this Leonard John potential, uh, 6, uh, 12 is represented because uh, you are forming a potential out of uh, R to the minus 12 and R to the minus 6. Um, and a combination of that actually gives you this dip uh, like um, Van der Waals bonding with um, the um, um, dip, uh, the dip representing uh, the um, a stable point, um, the local minimum uh, of the interaction. So there is actually an interplay between the Van der Waals um, and the Coulomb interaction uh, in the organic solids. Uh, so Coulomb being much more longer range and also uh, the Van der Waals being much shorter. Uh, so Van der Waals and Coulomb, the uh, interplay of them actually, uh, interplay of them um, holds uh, the organic lattice together. And um, the orbital overlap um, between molecules, as I mentioned, is small, so weak bonding. And that's also due to the Coulomb force, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the interplay. So that is um, balanced um, by the attractive and the vast force. So one is um, negative, one is positive. So when they uh, becomes net zero, that's the stability, uh, that's the stable uh, local minimum point of the um, structure in the organics. And small bandwidth actually results from the fact that you're only considering uh, these molecules these molecules um, um, interacting with each other uh, in the nearest neighbor uh, form. So uh, when there is um, a molecule A right next to each other and molecule B, only between the two, uh, the interaction is considered, not one, uh, uh, so not one further away from the uh, next neighboring molecule. Okay, uh, so that is uh, the basically uh, the theory of um, the um, type binding theory um, and the um, Wave function overlay is represented by this um, charge transfer integral, represented as T. Um, but uh, small bandwidth, um, more importantly, is um, related to the low mobility and the large effective mass in the organic systems.
okay uh, and um this um structure um if you actually uh, look at it then um can you actually uh, put in external forces uh in order to uh, make the binding much stronger and uh the um nearest neighbor treatment um of the um um of the energy structure is actually was actually confirmed uh, from this um hydrostatic pressure uh, measurement where uh, you'd expect since there was a balancing force between the um, Van der Waals and the uh, Coulomb interaction, if there's an external force and that can actually um, make the minimum point um, at somewhere in between or somewhere um, further onto uh, the um, nearer to the nucleus, then uh, it's going to actually change the electronic structure as well. So what this is showing, uh, the optical absorption, uh, so the um, um, energy gap and that is between the homo and lumo, uh, sorry, uh, the was made of homo and lumo, uh, these bands like um, energy levels, that actually changes um, upon uh, hydrostatic pressure. So that's the um, point of the, uh, just a second, of this measurement, because um, with pressure, you're actually making them um, uh, much closer uh, to each other. And therefore, uh, the orbital, um, orbital um, binding will be much stronger. So uh, that is uh, the result um, of this. Uh, so um, if I just give you the um, comparison in, um, as a summary, uh, the band transport um, and the hopping transport, um, they result um, from uh, this concept of um, bandwidth and how the localized charge carriers are. And these are related to the mobility, the parameter that we actually uh, want to use for comparing uh, different materials. Um, which are related to uh, this mean free path uh, um, parameters, um, which represents uh, the how um, how um, how over what distance carriers can freely travel without scattering. Okay, um, now uh, moving on to uh, the transistors. Uh, sorry about a um, very abrupt jump. Uh, I'm going to now talk about uh, the device aspect first, and then onto the organic materials. So uh, actually, um, before that, if we could have um, questions and, and like a small break, uh, since it's um, already uh, 40 minutes past uh, my lecture uh, from, from the audience. Uh, is there any um, question from the audience, please? Yeah, um, if you feel shy, uh, you can write in your um, Zoom chat and uh, there's this uh, chat uh, method, but... Uh, I don't think anyone is shy uh, in this audience, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe uh, after a sip of water, we'll continue. Okay, uh, now on to organic FETs. Uh, so we've covered uh, the transport. Um, properties and the basic concepts um, in organic semiconductors. Now uh, I'd like to move back to device concepts. Um, so FET, um, as I mentioned, um, it acts as like a switch. And how to best um, represent um, uh, FET uh, is that it's analogous um, to a tap. So to a tap meaning uh, uh, where you wash from, um, where you get some water from, is uh, so you just imagine the water company uh, is actually uh, as the source providing the water flow through the tap uh, to the sink. So uh, that's why it's actually called the drain, uh, one, of, uh, one of the electrodes. So there's a source of the current and there's a drain where the current is actually ending uh, and is passing through so that there's a continuous flow uh, of the current, uh, in this case, water. And what gate is doing is basically um, controlling how much water is flowing through the tap. So therefore, how much water is actually wasted and passing through the drain. So if you open the valve, meaning uh, the gate uh, is open, uh, means that there's a larger current uh, and therefore uh, this is switched on. Whereas if you close the, uh, close the valve, meaning uh, you close the gate, uh, then the current uh, flowing uh, through the um, tap is actually zero or almost zero, meaning it's completely off. So you can see that transistor uh, works almost similar way. And it's not uh, the water current uh, that's relevant in organic, uh, sorry, uh, in FETs, but um, uh, the, it is the charge current. Uh, so um, basically, um, so basically uh, you can think of it as um, controlling or switching uh, the current um, uh, by the gate. 
And uh, to remind you what uh, why organic FETs can be um, advantageous uh, in some aspects, um, they actually provide low low cost solutions uh, for um, uh, fabricating um, electronic devices. So low cost and larger larger area processes are possible because and they are solution processable uh, to an extent. And because uh, their uh, binding energy, uh, the crystal structure is much softer, and the, the requirement uh, for forming, uh, let's say, uh, an optimized morphology uh, and, and, the uh, and the phase transitions, and so all occur at low temperatures, uh, so 60 to 150 degrees process normally. And because um, they have van der Waals um, bonding um, between the molecules, they can actually um, conformally uh, be deposited onto, let's say, flexible substrates or various substrates possible. And what I'd like to um, highlight uh, of the organic semiconductor, uh, semiconductors as a strength is that we can actually add functionality uh, with organic molecules. So silicon, uh, since, it's, um, since uh, the structure is very rigid, and also uh, there are much room to, there isn't much room to play around with chemistry such that uh, it can be functionalized maybe only at the surface. But organic molecules, uh, since you can actually come up with various different designs um, with a variational, large variational molecular space uh, in terms of designs um, with synthesis, you can actually um, give um, organic molecules or um, actually assign different organic molecules with different properties. And all of these uh, is favorable for application to large area electronics as well as um, the display uh, as we've seen before. And here are some representatives of, of what other areas of um, organic electronics uh, can uh, lead on to due to these advantageous properties. So organic field effect transistors. Uh, so what um, constitutes as the main uh, characteristics of the transistors is uh, this um, output curve and the uh, transfer curve. Uh, and I'm going to briefly um, uh, mention that uh, from the transfer curve, uh, from the slope um, of the square root in the saturation mode, you can actually extract this mobility, uh, which I, uh, which I um, described in details in the Druid model. So we can actually extract mobility um, of these organic semiconductors uh, from this transfer curve is what is important. So, and also there are these other uh, device characteristics that tell you more about the devices, such as uh, the threshold voltage, which uh, actually represents uh, the, uh, it's related to um, how, how doped uh, the semiconductor material is, or how uh, how many traps there are uh, in the semiconductor, or the interface, and um, the um, and also uh, the mobility. You can also extract from the output curve um, from the uh, not the transconductance, um, but by uh, looking at the derivative um, di dv. So um, maybe a, as a summary, uh, remember that transfer curve uh, is important in extracting mobility, and therefore we're going to um, look at various transfer curves and, and compare different mobilities of different uh, molecules. And um, from the device contact arrangements, uh, so uh, how uh, on, what an FET looks like, uh, it looks like this. So you have this semiconducting channel, which are connected um, by metal source and drain electrodes. So this represents the bottom gate, bottom contact, um, uh, arrangement where the semiconducting, uh, with respect to the semiconducting layer, whether the gate electrode is actually um, at the, uh, below the below the channel, or is actually above the whether it's above the channel, it actually um, determines uh, whether it's bottom gate bottom contact or bottom gate top contact and um, all the others. So in this case, you have the semiconducting channel at the at the uh, topmost layer, and then you have uh, right below the source and drain electrodes, and therefore this is bottom contact because it's below the semiconducting channel. Bottom gate means that uh, it's, below the, uh, it's below the semiconducting channel as well, and therefore you have the gate insulator uh, that is separating uh, the channel uh, to the gate electrode. And uh, this forms the bottom gate, uh, bottom contact, or in short, you call it BGBC. And other arrangements are shown here, such as bottom gate top contact, for example, the semiconducting channel, the top contact, and there's the um, uh, gate um, uh, position below the semiconducting channel. So this is bottom gate top contact arrangement. So um, all these uh, are possible, and they have all pros and cons. Um, so we're going to look at a few examples of them. 
and different components of OFAT. So you actually not only have these metal electrodes um, for injecting charges, uh, injecting current and sending out currents, and also um, gating, uh, meaning accumulating charges and so on. You also have this passivation layer. And why this passivation layer is needed? Because um, um, many organic semiconducting materials uh, it actually um, suffers uh, from ambient stability. And therefore, uh, this passivation layer is very compact uh, in order to um, actually protect uh, the organic semiconductor layer and also the interfaces uh, where the um, chemical reactions can occur um, to, um, um, to prolong uh, the longevity of organic semiconductors. So um, there are different um, material types um, that can be used um, for these. Uh, so for example, gate metals, um, these all metals, and also there are alternatives, um, interestingly, such as transparent oxide. Uh, for example, if we want to um, make use of these um, organic FETs into, uh, let's say, um, um, let's say uh, the, um, um, the um, uh, transparent um, device forms, then you need a transparent contact. Uh, for, um, for gating uh, the channel. And there's the possibility of using PWSS, but uh, so far ITR is doing significantly better uh, than uh, uh, PWSS. And the substrate um, being glass and captain or polymer forms or metal foils. So it's just representing this um, um, ability to deposit organic semiconductors on uh, conformally onto various different uh, substrates. Again. So the challenges then, uh, so challenges in organic FETs is basically um, getting um, a large current um, and with a low driving voltage uh, so that we can operate, um, for example, on LED, uh, other types of devices with this FET. And the switching time, um, meaning, uh, so you've seen the requirements for um, how fast uh, these display panels need to be operated at, and therefore the larger the mobility as shown in this equation the uh, the smaller the switching time and therefore uh, you can operate your um, leds or pixels much faster high dynamic range uh, meaning the on and off uh, has to be very clearly distinguished uh, in terms of the current so that you exactly know when your pixel is on and when your pixel is off for example High transconductance and low um, soft threshold swing, uh, it means that um, actually uh, there is a um, there's an extent to how fast you can um, uh, how, how fast you can switch um, your um, transistor by um, sweeping the gate voltage, and that's related to uh, the soft threshold swing. And the steeper this is, uh, the lower the uh, soft threshold swing. And low threshold voltage meaning uh, the um, reducing the steady state power. So you want to actually have the transistor off when you are not applying your voltage, but you want to have it on uh, when you are applying some gate voltage, meaning uh, there are some um, channels um, which are which work in depletion mode, uh, meaning that you actually need to provide a um, finite gate voltage in order to um, completely turn off the channel. Um, but uh, you probably don't want that because it actually, um, uh, it actually means that you consume more power in the steady state uh, in order to um, maintain uh, the off uh, state uh, of transistors. So first we look at uh, how the molecular packing morphology and brain, size, brain sizes and so on, uh, they're related uh, to the, um, 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 the, this um, mobility challenge in the organic materials. So we'll, for that, we actually um, uh, distinguish uh, two different types of materials. So one is small molecule and the other is a polymer. But um, for all of them, uh, what we need uh, in the end uh, is uh, to improve mobility. Normally, what you need to do is to align these molecules so that you actually make your delocalization of the charges much, much larger. So in order to do that, what we want to do uh, is for a chain of rod-like molecules, uh, large pi conjugation length along the long axis, and therefore um, molecular packing along such direction will allow you uh, a um, faster charge transport and strengthen the intermolecular interaction. And this actually relates to you know, how um, big the bandwidth uh, of this electron structure is, uh, as I mentioned before. And you can achieve that by um, hydrogen bonds between molecules or also donor acceptor interaction and, and for this um, we'll actually talk about more in the polymer uh, section. And perpendicular molecular orientation to substrate surface. And this is just a consensus um, in, the, um, in the field where um, you actually have a 
better transport uh, and it's easy along the pi stacking direction um, of the molecules. Um, so where the pi molecules are sticking out along the direction, you have pi pi interaction and the transport is much easier in that direction. So uh, that is needed. And the crystallinity uh, is a debatable issue. So this is a more conventional and traditional idea that if you grow larger and larger crystals, of course, your transport will be better because uh, larger crystal means uh, more aligned uh, molecules and therefore um, better, uh, so longer delocalization length and longer uh, mean free path and so. But um, if you look at examples of you know, how crystals can be rigid and brittle, so for example, for applications such as um, flexible displays, uh, you might not want uh, such large crystals. Uh, you might want some amorphous systems. And for that, I think polymeric materials uh, can provide a, um, a partial solution too. So as I mentioned, we're going to distinguish between small molecules and polymers and I'll give you some examples. Um, so small molecules, as I mentioned, form these van der Waals um, um, interaction, interacting um, lattice um, between the molecules where uh, you actually have these um, four different um, four different packing structures. Uh, so one is herringbone, and the other is slip stacking. The third is a brick layer. Uh, it does look like brick, doesn't it? And also the uh, fourth one is a cofacial stacking. So all these um, different uh, stacking gives you different um, molecular orbital, uh, so charge transfer uh, uh, integral and molecular orbital overlap, and therefore the transport properties will be different. Um, most of polyacins or most of the materials actually um, uh, actually form herringbone um, stacking structure uh, to um, and give you a bit more information. And polymers and the situation is much different. So if you just look at the um, local structure, uh, what they do is either they uh, form um, edge on structure where onto the substrate, uh, your polymer backbone stacks edge on like this. So this represents a very crystalline region um, of the polymers. So in the other parts of the polymers, they're amorphous. Uh, so in the cofacial, uh, so uh, so in the uh, similar to cofacial stacking, you have a face-on um, orientation where your polymer backbone is actually stuck in face-on uh, to the substrate. So the different modes of molecular packing, uh, with different molecules. So uh, let's first go from uh, looking at the example of rubin. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, rubin is a polyacin. Uh, uh, it's polyacin derivative. Uh, so it's, it's a tetracin derivative where it's a, a four uh, a fused aromatic rings with the um, wings uh, next to it. So um, this actually um, forms a herringbone structure. Uh, and why we were interested uh, or why people were interested in this material is that the mobility of this material is really large. Uh, so 20 centimeters squared per volt second. So in the single crystal, uh, you can achieve a, a mobility up to this high. Uh, record uh, mobility for organic semiconductors. And um, so uh, these um, four phenyl side groups uh, actually um, allows you a better uh, packing uh, of these molecules. And um, I'm going to give you a, a, a brief hint that uh, the um, packing here, uh, the lattice parameter uh, on the uh, AC plane and along the BC plane, so this uh, lattice parameter B and A, they're different. So um, because uh, the structure is different, um, you would expect um, some uh, anisotropy uh, in terms of the transport. Uh, so depending on which direction that uh, the crystal uh, is facing uh, or through which direction the current is sent in, the um, transport uh, will be different. So uh, the single crystal can be actually uh, made with vapor, physical vapor transport uh, method, which I will skip over. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, I don't. I, I think many of you know um, uh, Professor John Rodders and Northwestern. Uh, so, John Rodders, uh, uh, Professor John Rodders, actually started out um, with an organic um, electronics field, um, and it's actually his work uh, in science um, back in 2004, a long time ago. Uh, so, he what he did uh, was basically by using this um, um, by using this um, PDMS stamp method, you with the organic crystal, rubin crystal that you made with um, physical vapor transport uh, method, you actually attach and detach uh, the single crystal um, according to a different direction uh, of alignment. So um, what you do is basically you attach uh, your single crystal onto these contacts um, between source and drain electrodes, and the current will be flowing in a particular direction. 
you delaminate and you um, you uh, tilt your angle and then attach again. So what that does is you're able to uh, send in current either along A direction, or B direction, or in, or in between. So so that you can actually measure uh, the mobility um, or transport according to uh, the um, current direction relative to uh, either, either the A axis or the B axis. So uh, the result is the following. Um, as you expect, um, the transport is very different uh, along uh, which direction uh, that your current is facing. Uh, so here, uh, the more favorable um, direction of transport is along the B direction uh, because the um, molecular over, um, orbital overlap is much stronger in that direction than in the A direction. And you can kind of see that from this, um, the, um, the transport interval between this molecular orbital sticking out of plane here and here will be much closer. And therefore, the charge transport interval is likely to be much stronger there than from here uh, to there, for example. So it is kind of expected uh, that this uh, would occur. So along the B direction, we'll be um, at 180 degrees and 360 degrees, whereas uh, along the A direction, we'll be at 90 degrees and 270 degrees. So all of these are in the basal plane of the A and B uh, plane. So you can actually measure mobility uh, along these directions, is what, what I was uh, suggesting. And this uh, was confirmed um, with um, many different groups. Uh, so uh, here comes uh, Professor Zenon Bach, uh, who also started out with um, working on uh, electronic, organic electronics, and still uh, works on uh, organic electronics, more, but more on the fashion of um, the um, flexible and stretchable um, electronic materials nowadays. So uh, this confirms uh, the collection of um, entire uh, communities and uh, results on the Rubin single crystal uh, confirms that it has a very anisotropic uh, transport. Okay, so if we move on to uh, some, um, let's say, um, more polycrystalline uh, structure. So we've looked at the uh, single crystalline um, audit uh, system now. Uh, so if we move on to more polycrystalline structure, now the effect of grain boundary and the, um, the crystal size and uh, the morphology becomes very important. And uh, how we grow um, polycrystal and why it's uh, technical, uh, technologically relevant is that we actually need to make thin films out of these organic materials. If you want to uh, make your uh, devices as densely as possible and uh, as densely stacked as possible, the way to do that is you need to make a thin film of semiconductors. And in order to deposit thin films, uh, there are many different ways, uh, but for small molecules, Thermal evaporation is currently the best method. So it's a vacuum deposition technique. Basically, uh, it's undergoing uh, uh, in the um, uh, evacuated chamber, apply um, joule heating so that your um, source material or powders in, in powder forms normally, and they get heated up and undergo um, sublimation so that they can be deposited on the substrate. And of course, the control parameters of this um, um, as you, as you may well know, technique uh, is the deposition rate and uh, substrate temperature. So how fast you um, sublime your material, how, how um, hot uh, or cold your substrate surface is, and also the post-deposition treatments. After depositing the film, how you heat it up so that you actually get uh, this um, um, optimized uh, or wanted morphologies uh, out of these films. And on the contrast, um, what, um, can be done uh, for polymers and also um, by solubilizing uh, these organic semiconductors is the solution processes. Although I still believe uh, the infrastructure uh, for um, vacuum deposition is much uh, better established in, uh, in industry uh, than the solution processing technique. This is just looking at the future. Um, so we are actually able to provide um, a high throughput, um, large area uh, device fabrication method uh, with the solution processing method. So for example, the spin coating, um, because you can make solutions uh, out of these semiconductors. And also, if you, can, if you can do that, then you can actually ink the, ink the print. So you can pattern and deposit uh, the materials at the same time uh, with these techniques. So uh, in this case, the material solubility is a key parameter. And that is much better allowed by polymers and then in small molecules uh, in terms of forming a uh, um, wanted morphology as well. So. Uh, Maybe if I go into this growth processes, it will be uh, quite a lot. So I will just um, skip over. And basically, um, what I want to tell you is that there are different um, growth modes. Um, so um, 
I'm not an expert uh, in this uh, thin film growth mode, um, but what I understand uh, from this is that you have these two main uh, different mechanisms um, of growth um, of, um, uh, for example, if you start from the atomistic scale of how uh, the atom uh, to substrate interaction and atom to atom interaction, they differ. So depending on which winds, so which is dominant, you can get either Frank van der Meer growth or Vermeer Weber growth. So one is actually uh, forming a smooth layer by layer growth, so wetting uh, the surface. The other is actually um, a 3D island formation. So they like to stick to themselves. Uh, it's more like, and mostly uh, in the, uh, realistically or in real life, you get this um, somewhere in between mode. Uh, so for organic materials, uh, I think uh, it's very well known that for pentacin that I mentioned, for example, the first layer that you form completely wets, but uh, the, from the second layer on, uh, the atomic uh, or molecular interaction becomes bigger such that they form island uh, kind of formation. So uh, there are these three different modes um, of um, growth, and it occurs via um, these um, diffusion, nucleation, and the growth stages, but uh, I'll probably skip this uh, since uh, it's quite a lot in details. But why this is relevant is because um, I mentioned pentacin growth, and pentacin deposition uh, it can form uh, many different morphologies um, out of uh, controlling the growth temperature, and the deposition rate. So you're seeing these examples of lamella, pyramidal, inclined, dendritic, and giant brain morphologies uh, out of pentacin by just controlling deposition rate and the growth temperature. And now the question is, what would you want to use for your um, electronic materials? So um, as you can see here, uh, the mobility um, values are actually um, values are actually plotted uh, in this uh, example uh, where. Uh, the um, mobility um, for, let's say, and um, these um, so was uh, was um, marked here as asterisk signs and the um, unfilled triangle, so this dendritic and also um, pyramidal shape uh, have the best mobilities um, out of these morphologies. And the giant brain and the um, uh, the um, lamella uh, not so much. So um, from this, uh, you can see that uh, okay. We'd want to form this kind of dendritic morphology uh, in, in order to actually um, enhance uh, the transport uh, in the thin film of pentacin. So that is um, one of the ways you can tune mobility. And the other is related to the surface, so interface. Um, so um, I haven't mentioned uh, probably, but uh, what you're actually measuring as the mobility in FET is the mobility of the carriers accumulated at the um, silicon dioxide, so this is gate dielectric and semiconductor interface. So you can treat this interface and you can passivate this interface, meaning uh, there might be some hydroxyl groups uh, or uh, unsaturated hydro hydro hydroxyl groups, which actually act as trap sites for um, carriers. And you can passivate these defects um, with actually, um, so this is the um, self-assembled monolayer um, method, where you are using these silane molecules to bind chem chemisorb onto uh, these dielectric surfaces where uh, the um, OH bond is missing. And from that, you're actually passivating and what is facing uh, the organic semiconductor, which is here, uh, is the um, alkyl, uh, these alkyl uh, groups um, at the surface. So that actually um, passivates uh, the trap um, traps at the gate dielectric interface. That allows you a better mobility. So the case is seen here where the mobility can be improved uh, um, by, um, I think, uh, yes, uh, mobility can be improved um, by this method um, with uh, spin casting and also um, self-assembled monolayer treatment. So now onto the polymer FETs. Um, but before that, probably, uh, are there any questions um, from the audience on the small molecule uh, section? I know I'm going through this um, very fast. Uh, so any um, elementary questions or basic questions are also welcome. I have I have a few questions. Oh, thank you. Uh, short, short ones. Mm -hmm. So what, what about the thickness, the typical mm. thickness of those uh, mm. organic layer I mean, in mm. transistor? I mean, in silicon ah. transistor, the channel thickness approaches to the atomic like scale. Mm. Mm -hmm. so what's the case in organic uh, transistors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question, Professor. Um, so uh, the um, 
problem I think for making monolayer um, organic um, film I think is quite difficult due to this um, um, growth mode. I think um, I mentioned uh, that this occurs via um, SK, but at the same time, I don't think you get a continuous film uh, from my experience uh, with, uh, for example, thermal deposition uh, below 10 nanometers. So I think a um, reasonable range that you go for is from 10 nanometers. That's also quite thin because um, you're not sure whether you have formed uh, a continuous uh, layer. Uh, but uh, for example, 20 nanometers, I think is um, okay. And people normally use um, 20 to 40 nanometers uh, to get the thin film uh, um, properties um, at the same time, uh, not too thick. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. That's probably too thin for measuring uh, thermal properties, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Thin. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you so much for your questions. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Okay. Um, um, yeah, uh, it's fine not having questions, but I hope you're still there, though, uh, the audience. Um, um, okay, let's move on to polymer FETs. Uh, so I'm going to um, skip uh, through a few slides to give you a brief outline of how polymer FETs have evolved. So um, this, this is the same thing. So um, organic electronics is strives for low cost production, and um, that is related to being able to solution process. And solution processability of polymer uh, comes from the fact that you can actually uh, functionalize polymers very easily. So, for example, uh, you can have these substitutions, dolubilizing substitutions that allow you uh, to um, uh, um, allow you uh, to dissolve um, these polymers uh, into um, uh, non-polar solvents. Um, and um, with that, we can actually make solutions out um, that can be used for spin coating or inkjet printing, for example. And the basic unit is the following. So what you have is uh, you have this um, backbone uh, structure, the core units, um, uh, which can be um, ranging from uh, these um, uh, these uh, thiophen units uh, to the indigo units and uh, the BT units and so. Um, they are uh, they are acronyms, but um, important ones I'm going to show you uh, later. And these substitutions, you can have these linear archive side chains or also the branched ones. And what has become more popular nowadays is actually looking at these um, glyphylated sidechains for different purposes. Um, so not just for using electronic materials, but also using uh, these materials for mixed ionic electronic conductors. So for that, um, glyphylated sidechains is um, much uh, more promising. So um, solution, solution processability, uh, it can be actually enhanced and also uh, these Side chains, if they interdigitate or if they interact with each other by van der Waals, it can actually um, it can actually stabilize uh, the solid state structure of the polymer films. And now the challenge is here is to make molecular designs that satisfy both a uh, low degree of structure order in the solid state, uh, meaning uh, you like to uh, make the polymer chains aligned as much as possible, and some environmental stability uh, against um, protein induced oxidative doping and bleaching. So that I'm going to explain uh, more in details. So with that, uh, so I'd like to mention the start um, of all these um, polymeric um, or organic transistors uh, uh, throughout the history. So back in 1986, uh, it was this uh, Japanese group, uh, the Ando, um, who actually uh, measured uh, the um, uh, mobility of this FET made of, probably you can't see very well, and this is the polythiophene. So it's a, or legal um, uh, to be uh, to be exact. So it's not completely a polymer, but it's an oligomer made of um, polythiophene, where the measured um, transfer curve, um, you, uh, sorry, output curve this is. Um, so this looks uh, almost similar to what I've shown you uh, in the previous slides. And so you can see that this actually acts as an FET quite well, but the mobility is very, very disappointing, almost measurable. Uh, so 10 to the minus five. So people expected that, okay, uh, this is um, probably because of the low film uh, quality and, uh, and that results in the low mobility. And the processing as well, uh, since um, I'm calling this first generation, 1G, since this, um, as you've seen, the substitutions, and there are no substitutions, um, it only is consisted of this um, pi-conjugated core. 
45 pin. So it has no side chains, no side chain. And therefore, this has this had to be um, deposited by a, what's called electrochemical polymerization. So uh, since this is poorly soluble in most solvents, uh, the only way to get the films there is to uh, put like a big electrochemical cell and polymerize this polythiophene uh, material out of uh, thiophene monomer. So there are films, but then the controlling the morphology and the film quality is much more difficult in that way. And, uh, and then it moves on to the, um, what is now more practical form of the second uh, generation um, polymer. So uh, this actually has, um, with polythiophene, with the solubilizing side chains with it. So this is called poly 3 hexithiophene so P3HD. It's actually a very um, stereotypical organic FBT material. So it's a P-type uh, uh, organic uh, um, semiconductor, uh, which has actually a long enough alkyl side chain for solution processability. So how long? That is out of uh, so this um, six uh, linear um, hydrocarbon alkyl chain. So uh, six carbon length uh, it is enough uh, to give you the solution processability that you need. And, and there are different and synthetic um, uh, rigid regularities that you can actually um, play around with. Um, so one you can do is, uh, okay, you can have your um, side chain um, in the head and also um, head uh, and also in the tail. So head, tail. So this is a head to tail, head to tail um, coupling. Whereas here uh, you have um, from, from this uh, link tail to tail. So this is all respect to this link, uh, tail to tail. So tail to tail, uh, and this is now becomes respect to this head to tail. So tail to tail, head to tail, TTHT. So all like this, you can have HTHH and also TTHH. So um, as you can see, the rigid regularity is very different uh, in this four chemically distinct rigid isomers. So the molecular formula is the same, but where you put your uh, side chain is different. And HH couplings are unfavorable because, as you can see, uh, with HH. So these HH, you can see that um, these will be quite long, uh, so the uh, archive side chain, and that will actually um, be unfavorable due to the spherical, uh, spherical effects. And that drives the twist of diaphragms. So that is at a twisted angle uh, with that diaphragm um, because of the head-to-head -head coupling. And in the rigid regular head to tail couplings, uh, so HTHT, uh, they easily access a low energy planar um, conformation, meaning the backbone will be much planar, much more planar in the HTHT um, coupled um, P3HT than in the other three. So this actually has the best mobility uh, of all the polymers, uh, the isomers. So uh, what's nice about this P3C material is that uh, you can actually spin coat uh, this material uh, and form a edge um, um, on structure and a nice uh, morphology with it. So um, percentage of head to tail um, coupling uh, you can um, characterize and how that relates to um, mobility uh, is quite important. So as, as we mentioned, HT coupling is favorable, HH is not favorable depending on how many HT couplings there are in the polymers, your mobility starts to increase. So of up to uh, uh, 10 to the minus two. And um, so HT coupling actually is favorable uh, towards transport. And if I briefly mention uh, this work um, by um, Professor Henning Sweringhouse, who is actually happens to be my supervisor, uh, therefore I need to promote his work. Yeah, uh, so um, his, um, Pioneering work uh, in this P3HT polymer of uh, two dimensional transport um, in um, P3HTs, uh, which was reported in Nature 1999, shows that um, this edge on stacking, so having the polymer backbones edge onto the substrate rather than onto the face, uh, uh, face on stacking, is much more favorable uh, in terms of the in plane transport. And the reason is why. Uh, so I've already mentioned that uh, the um, the molecular um, overlap between the pi molecular overlap in the edge on um, packing is much stronger uh, than in the, um, let's say you want to transport through uh, the um, alkyl side chain, like in the face on orientation. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, what I call this uh, is a 2.5G, uh, so second and half of generation is PBTTT. Uh, so this PBTTT, uh, which actually, uh, 
uh, was um, the main uh, system that I um, used or has been the main system that I've been using uh, for um, um, for investigating charge transport in polymeric materials. Uh, so this is an upgrade version of P3HT, where um, although head-to-tail coupling, uh, it allows you a favorable um, coplanarization, there's a lot of torsion uh, in the carbon-carbon um, single bond uh, in this um, P3HT molecule. So the way to um, reduce uh, such um, a torsion effect is to actually um, fuse uh, these thiophane rings together. So if you have this fused thiophane, then of course they are because covalently bonded, you've um, guaranteed uh, the uh, backbone pluralization uh, along, uh, along uh, this extent. And that actually helps you uh, to reduce torsion uh, in the polymer and also a better um, charge delocalization. And because we have a reduced um, side chain density uh, compared to PCHT, actually uh, what we have is an interdigitation. So van der Waals interaction between these side chains uh, such that it stabilizes these backbone lamella uh, together. Whereas P3HT, because the density is higher, uh, so this has no interdigitation, uh, almost repels each other. So that's, uh, that's the difference. And um, what's also important is that um, by having this um, fused thiophane and also a larger delocalization, you have um, better oxygen uh, oxidative stability. So HOMO um, of uh, the material is, of course, related to um, how to localize your pi orbital uh, in the molecule. And that uh, is going to be actually um, uh, much better uh, for PBTTT uh, than P3HT, meaning that the HOMO is actually deeper than P3HT. So, um, uh, so um, that actually means that there's an oxidative level near 5.0 electron volt uh, where you can actually um, uh, oxidize um, your, um, your molecule um, by um, taking away an electron uh, by oxygen species, forming O3 minus, um, O2 minus, sorry. Uh, then uh, it, it means that um, PBTTT, uh, in the off state, uh, you'd want your off current uh, because you want it to act as a switch. You want it to have a low off current as possible, meaning uh, a low charge carrier concentration. But if there's an oxidative um, doping or, um, or oxidization, uh, then uh, what happens, uh, oxidation, then what happens is uh, the off current actually um, goes up um, because uh, you've now, uh, you now have carriers that can um, carry transport, um, carry uh, current in the channel. Um, at a, um, a, a gate voltage that you normally expect an off uh, state. So this is um, related to oxidative doping. So um, that is the second and a half generation. And the third generation is actually a donor acceptor uh, polymer. Uh, so these are actually, um, so what's different uh, is that you actually form now um, uh, two different um, core units together in the same material. Uh, so one is the acceptor unit and one is donor unit, meaning the homo lumo energetics is different. And with that, uh, what you what normally happens is if you plug these um, two units together, the homo is going to follow uh, the shallow one, um, uh, the shallow one, uh, which is um, which is going to be uh, the uh, homo of the donor, and acceptor uh, the lumo is going to follow uh, that of the um, acceptor, which is going to be a deeper. So the band gap or the homo lumo gap reduces. Uh, so lower band gap of this core polymer uh, makes uh, actually um, different, uh, gives rise to different properties um, of um, ambipolar, such as ambipolar transport uh, in this uh, donor acceptor polymer. So as you can see here, um, I've only shown you unipolar uh, FET so far, but by um, switching uh, the gate voltage, what you can do is you can actually with this ambipolar material, um, uh, selenium-based uh, DPP BT, you actually operate it in the P-type as a P-type or also the N-type. Uh, so you can get both uh, ambipolar uh, P-type and N-type -type transport, meaning ambipolar in the same material. So um, um, in addition to that, um, so the new um, the new um, perhaps a material um, design uh, for um, polymeric uh, semiconducting materials for electronics is actually uh, not um, using the crystallinity so much because people have, uh, people have been uh, investigating that uh, for far too long. 
and we have been uh, sometimes successful and not so successful in um, in some materials. What we now can do is actually use um, these amorphous uh, polymers. So this is what's called IDTBT. Uh, although I haven't, uh, so by mistake, I haven't put the reference here. This uh, is work uh, by uh, my uh, previous group, uh, Henning Searinghouse, Henning Searinghouse's group, um, on, so reported in Nature 2014, where they reported that this IDTBT uh, it has an amazingly um, low torsion and therefore a large uh, and rigid backbone planarity uh, along the chain uh, for this polymer. So compared to PBTTT, as you can see, these um, polymer backbones like um, wiggling in between. You can see that um, although uh, this IDTBT is amorphous in morphology, uh, the torsion is much less. So you have an amazing um, backbone planarity um, of this IDTBT. And therefore, although uh, the um, although um, the polymer is uh, amorphous in morphology, you can actually um, have um, high mobility up to one. And that uh, was the origin uh, of disorder, uh, nearly disorder free transport uh, in this IDTBT material. So to summarize, um, so so far people have been looking at how to increase crystallinity uh, in polymer backbones to actually achieve a better transport. But now we are also looking at um, these uh, novel designs of, of amorphous polymers uh, that can allow you um, a low deg degree of torsion. And once you have that rigid backbone planarity, you can actually achieve a quite high mobility with this material. Right. Um, so I don't think I have much time, but uh, how ambipolar transport transistor can be used um, to give you a more fun aspect of it. You can actually, it's much easier to uh, make inverter. So you actually reduce a step uh, in making um, logical elements in the electronic devices. So such as log ring oscillator and inverter, which are, um, which are crucial elements uh, in the um, uh, electronics. Uh, digital electronics. Um, so, uh, and also what you can do is you, since both holes and electrons can flow, um, when they meet in the middle, uh, you can actually have some recombination of these electrons and holes, meaning you can emit light uh, with these transistors. And what, what, uh, what that's called is light emitting transistor now. So in the ambipolar transport, uh, in the ambipolar transistor, uh, what you can have is injecting holes and electrons. And if they meet in the middle, uh, when you have a balanced um, transport between them, then you can actually have uh, these, you see this line uh, of emission. So this looking at from uh, the optical micrograph and this line of emission and this um, wiggly line uh, actually represents the emission uh, from this um, material. Okay, um, so I think um, with that, uh, so it recaps uh, the polymeric um, FETs, how we went from um, unsoluble um, materials, insoluble materials to actually soluble and also more complicated designs. Um, and um, Professor Zhang, uh, how, how much time do I have? Uh, so, uh, yeah, two minutes, right? Uh, uh, you can use a few more minutes. Okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just um, try to um, address um, some of the issues uh, that we face um, in transistors. Uh, then, so first one is actually um, um, doping. Uh, so basically, um, this conducting polymer, uh, although uh, this was um, awarded the Nobel Prize in two thousand two thousand, um, not uh, uh, not all of uh, the transport properties um, have now uh, been um, discovered. Uh, so, for example. Um, so this um, particular work on polyacetylene, um, so by doping it, um, we're able to achieve quite a high, high conductivity, uh, but we're still at the stage where we want to still uh, develop um, a more efficient doping method uh, for achieving a higher conductivity and higher doping level. Um, so the challenges, challenges there are um, related to the device aspects. So I should briefly show you uh, the device aspect of it. Um, so since we've been uh, talking about transistors, if we want to make uh, a dense and dense uh, pixel uh, of transistors, we actually need to downscale FETs, meaning, uh, so if you want to um, look at uh, these pixels um, through your um, AR or VR um, gadgets now, uh, you're actually now able to see from closer distance uh, much um, better the spacing between the pixels. So you need to make the pixels as dense as possible uh, for future applications. But with doing so, 
the overall device resistance is actually constituting of the channel resistance and the contact resistance. This scales with L, um, as we've previously seen uh, for resistivity formula, but this contact resistance doesn't. And therefore, uh, as you downscale FETs, uh, your contact resistance is going to be dominant, and that is even uh, dominant um, for the scale of micron channel devices. And for that, um, people have been using um, some SAM treatment and some injection layer to get the energetics, the injection barrier lower. But um, what we are doing, uh, we are wanting to do this um, from the doping perspective. So let's say um, we, um, we formulate a similar doping method uh, to that of ion implantation doping in silicon, then uh, this will actually reduce the contact resistance a lot so that um, the power consumption um, of uh, the um, of driving FET and also downscaling will be much more variable. And how we did that was uh, just doping this um, uh, doping these contact areas um, via uh, the method called uh, solid state diffusion, which is um, highlighted here, where the FOTC and Q, uh, which is a dopant, they undergo diffusion in the solid state to actually both dope uh, these polymeric materials. So um, what we did was we actually um, um, demonstrated that the contact resistance was um, much uh, much lower um, with this method. But also we um, actually solved uh, these diffusion problems um, in the in the um, uh, in the resulting device. So um, for that um, we we used various uh, material designs uh, such as um, FOTC and Q or TC and Q combined. One is electrically active, one is not active. So combining these together uh, was, an, uh, was an effective way of actually suppressing um, and achieving uh, not just a low contact resistance, but uh, actually uh, achieve low contact, contact resistance that is stable uh, for a long time, uh, which is important in the longevity uh, of your uh, organic FPTs. Yes, um, so um, if I had more time, I've been able to um, uh, brief you with more of my research work but i think that is enough uh, for now uh, we've spent an hour and 32 minutes so um with that uh, i'd like to thank you uh, for your attention uh, i know it was a very long talk and i talked very fast so if you have any questions um for the remaining five minutes i think uh, for the q a time uh please let me know thank you okay thank you professor uh, kang so much for your amazing lecture I think it's a great to hear about all the solid background of your research and I kind of feel bad because we couldn't really hear much about your own research oh not at all yeah I can yeah. talk about this some other time yeah thank you <laughs> oh. okay so there's one question from the audience uh so Michael uh so your question was how Frankel and Vanya Mot excitons are relevant for LEDs. So they are very relevant, actually. Um, so what I haven't been able to um, explain in detail is how, yeah, here. Yeah. So uh, as you can see here, the um, Franklin excitons, uh, they have much larger binding energy uh, than the Vanya Mott uh, excitons. Uh, let me just see if I have. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a slide for that. Sorry, but yeah, if I, if I just, oh yeah, no, no, no there is okay. Okay, so um, basically, um, binding energy is related to the fact that an, an exciton, uh, so that is either created from a photon, or uh, or either is emitting a photon, so exciton, which is an electron hole pair, they are bound by Coulomb interaction. And their uh, binding energy is determined by the dielectric constant in the medium. So how well the field uh, can penetrate the medium and affect uh, the other. And that is actually much larger in organics uh, than in inorganics. And therefore, you form Frankel excitons, so with the smaller size, and then the one mott exciton, the larger size. So here, uh, one exciton it actually extends to many, uh, many atoms. Uh, so that's very large, whereas Frankel exciton is typically within a molecule. What that does is that the hole and electron, and the electron, let's say from LED, you're injecting holes and electrons. What needs to happen is they need to meet, form an exciton, then recombine. So in order to do that, uh, the binding energy should be very large to increase 
uh, the rate of recombination. So in order to radiate photons, you actually need larger binding energy uh, in order to um, have electron and hole wanting to meet together and then recombine to produce a photon. Hopefully that uh, explained your question. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I think your your lecture is straightforward, so everyone <laughs> understands very clearly. Maybe. Uh, okay. okay. Oh. Okay. Oh, can I can I just mention that Professor Zhang? Uh, so this um and some of the slides um on this lecture were actually um modified from uh, Stephen Forrest, uh, Professor Stephen Forrest, uh, uh, lecture slides um, on, I think, uh, foundations and applications of Ghanaian electronics, just for the um, references. Uh, so if people are interested, yeah, they could have a look at those oh. slides as well. Yeah. Okay. 